So um, in, your, uh, in your notes, uh, or in your workshop books, I've given you a much longer presentation than I'm going to give today, so that when you see that a slide isn't the same, just keep flipping forward and you'll find the one we're on. Um, and I want to give you a, 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 a talk today, not so much about what we're doing in Australia uh, from a, an uncovered perspective. I've given that before here at PDAC, and many of you will be aware of it. But I want to talk to you about one critical aspect of that, and it is, it is this, this conceptual understanding of what is a mineral system. We, we used to be talking about deposits and deposit models, and then this term mineral systems ripped off from the petroleum sector. Petroleum systems uh, started to come in. But in people's minds, it has, and even in Australia, you talk to different people, and they have a very different picture of what a mineral system is. Right? So I just wanted to talk to you a bit about that today. Because it is, it is critical, and it underpins the conceptual um, uh, basis for the targeting science and for identifying the high value data sets, the information gaps that we must fill at various scales. And, it, and it's informing all of the geological surveys in, in Australia, uh, all of the state surveys, GA, um, all right to uncover, and uncover is really based around the mineral systems. Uh, approach. So, it's late. Some of you will be falling asleep. This is the conclusion slide. Okay. <laughs> and it, it, what I want you to take away is there's a couple new things coming out with mineral systems. Is understanding that they're I mean, complex dynamic systems. No one would argue with that. But they're exhi exhibiting a special thing called self-organized critical behavior, right? and that has important implications. Critical elements of the mineral system right, are the three circles on your left. Right? That is fertility, the intersection of fertility, favorable whole lithosphere architecture, so right from the lithosphere cenosphere boundary up to the upper kilometer that we're usually worried about for the mineral deposit, and favorable transient geodynamics. These geodynamic triggers are moments in time that trigger high quality ore formation in what is otherwise a barren or low grade maelstrom of deformation, magmatism, metamorphism, fluid flow, etc. So what we are interested in is these, these high quality moments of ore formation. So this is the problem. Right? It's how do we predict the location and the geometry of high quality mineral districts? at a range of scales, from the Kraton scale, where we would look for the, for, the, for the belt or the region, within that, where would we look for the camp, within that, where would we look for the prospect that we're going to drill and then delineate the ore chutes within the deposit. Right? So different problems at different scales, different processes more or less relevant at different scales, which is something that we'll touch on as well. And so this is an important, Mike showed a version of this one too. So this is important, uh, this diagram, because it, it, it shows conceptually the issue we have in identifying new high quality mineral di districts. What it shows is the trade-off between our ability to detect versus our ability to predict, right? or the dependence, the relative effectiveness. Right? Once you get down to the deposit scale, Prediction is still important. We still have to put concepts around our data to make it, to put them into knowledge. But we have the ability to collect a lot of high density, high quality, high resolution data. And I've just listed a few there. People have talked about a few. Um, whereas when, when you're actually worried about, about regional targeting, you have no detection uh, methodology. For example, at the scale of the Yilgarn Kraton, Right? Or scale scale of the superior, where's the next gold deposit? Well, I mean, I have no detection technology at that scale that I can systematically apply uh, across the, across an entire kraton like that. Now, this is the important point, Good point. and and it, it's important because it's it's I didn't understand. It's when your flexibility goes way down and your costs start to come way up. Because when you decide that that's the area that I'm going to have a red hot go, now 
you're, you're committing your people, time, and money resources. You only have so much of that, and it's like entering into a marriage. You do it forsaking all others, right? Because that's the, that's, you've decided that's where you're going to be, right? So it's the most important decision, and it actually is what turns expiration managers into chain smokers, okay? is, the, <laughs> is this decision at the camp scale. And the problem is, reducing from that sort of 100 kilometer order of magnitude range down to around that 30 kilometer box is, we have, again, usually no detection technology for the OR systems we're looking for. It's largely still a predictive exercise. I then, in the next couple, next slide, I've shown you a, a, a traditional view of how we look at a, at, at a footprint. I don't have the slide up there. But what we're looking at is the leakage of heat, fluids, and components in those fluids interacting with the rock and the expression of that around a deposit. And we try to push that out. Right? And that's, that's a space that, that, that we're doing good work in, the footprints is doing good work in that space. If we go undercover, even those types of, of, of uh, footprints are challenged and they don't get to the scale we need for area selection when we're going undercover. And by cover, I'm not talking like a kilometer deep. I'm talking, you know, 50 meters of challenging cover or just challenging regolith that render my exploration technologies essentially blind. Okay. So when we're looking for a new high quality mineral district, it's the largest scale possible footprint of not just the deposits, but the mineral system that's relevant to our targeting models, and that's actually, I shouldn't have that on the slide, it should be the mineral system. And these footprints differ substantially for the, from how we're, we've been trained in economic geology generally through our classes and certainly how I was trained as a geoscientist. Murray showed this one. It's important because it shows scale, right? So that scale, in a vertical sense, he says he goes down 45 kilometers, probably actually has components of the whole system that go down further than that, there's a slide previous to that, I believe, that even talks about things like Mississippi Valley type deposits in the, uh, in the, in the US and showing that, uh, that dolomite front. Why is the dolomite front important? Because pretty much every system sits along it, right? Again, something that, that narrows your search space quickly if you, if you know that's relevant and then you can map it. So, we go to uh, the aspect of of uh, mineral systems. Now, so in mineral systems, there's some just basic constraints to consider just from a fundamental viewpoint. What a mineral system does is it takes elements for, uh, uh, that are generally in a low concentration in large volumes of rock, and it moves them through the lithosphere at some scale, and it concentrates them in a small volume of rock at high concentration. Right? The only plausible mechanism to do that is large scale advective fluid flux. And so that basically, ore deposits are the foci of large scale mass and energy transfer. And just I'll show some examples of some world class deposits here. Uh, Olympic Dam, oops, you say it's wonky, it's not working. Or am I just pointing it at myself? No. But Olympic Dam on your top left. Uh, it's, uh, the scale there is about uh, six or eight kilometers um, in that northwest direction by a few kilometers across there, and it's just, it's a big breccia, right? You, you're, when you're underground, you never get out of breccia. You think you're in the granite outside, and you look at it, and you go, actually, that's, that's brecciated, right? So it's just massive amount of energy. Uh, Perseverance, uh, the uh, largest Kamadiai-hosted uh, nickel sulfide deposit, and the, uh, the hottest magma channel ever recorded on Earth looking at the mineral chemistry and back calculated. Norilsk, uh, one of, if not the largest flood basalt, uh, continental flood basalt province. Uh, same timing as a, as a mass ex uh, extinction event. World's largest nickel deposit. Another important relationship in, uh, in mineral deposits and in geology in general is that we see these power law relationships that are scale invariant. Uh, what what that that meaning that we see you know a few big and many many small deposits uh, and we see that with things like earthquakes 
uh, showing a power law relationship. That's why the, the, uh, the Richter scale is, uh, is, is um, uh, logarithmic. Uh, we also see it in, uh, in things like, like fault systems, looking at different data sets, seismic to wells, you still see that power law frequency. The tail offs are just on scale of observation in either a seismic data set or a drill hole. At one point, you don't sample them. At one point, you don't see enough of them. Uh, and then in, uh, in deposits, showing this power law relationship. And you can use this, actually, as an indicator for how mature your camp is. And there's several publications out on that. And the, this is diagnostic of a, of a self-organized system. So the, the tendency of a, of, a, of a complex system to show order right, is, is what the, the physicists in the, in, the, in the 80s started to look at and, and called self-organized systems. And they often order around a, a critical point, or, or what the physicists would call a phase transition. And the key drivers of self-organized critical behavior are that you, you add energy continually into the system, but you put a barrier in place that stops that energy from dissipating into a sink. When that happens, the system builds up these, these energy gradients, and when it releases it, it releases it in a blast very quickly. So think of it as a, as a, as a lightning storm. Right? You've got clouds in the sky building up energy. They want to, that energy wants to get to the ground. The problem is, is there's a, a, there's a, a, a non-conductive layer of atmosphere sitting between the clouds and the ground. So it builds up the energy, builds up the energy, and then bang, the lightning bolt comes, and it takes the path of least resistance to the ground. Okay. And these, these, the physicists call these energy releases avalanches. Okay. And the system will remain at that, in that self-organized state as long as that energy flow is maintained and the threshold barrier is, is intact. An example is earthquakes, right? So in earthquakes, you've got energy coming in from the motion of the plates. You're trying to dissipate that by flow in the, in the lithosphere. The problem is, is you've got a brittle uh, upper crust. That brittle upper crust essentially stops the energy from dissipating. It builds up, builds up, builds up, bang. It builds up, builds up, builds up, bang. And they always show these, these uh, power law relationships, these avalanches. So ore systems essentially are the same. You put in energy at the bottom. You, so the, the left shows the self-organized uh, uh, critical system. You put a threshold barrier in place. That threshold bar barrier can be physical. It can be geodynamic, as we'll discuss. And then the energy is released in short, sharp bursts as it dissipates to the sink. As long as we keep the threshold barrier there, as long as we keep the energy coming in, we get the ore, as soon as you take that away, the ore formation stops. So on the right-hand scale, shows the same type of thing for the mineral system. It shows the, a fluid, a, a source region, a fluid delivery pathway from that into an area where you have that threshold barrier put in place. And when you have the avalanches coming out where the red box is at the deposit scale, that's where you're getting high quality ore formation. The, the interesting thing, the way that's drawn there, is, is that you can then map at different scales the part of the system that you're trying to map. So when I'm, trying to, when I'm looking at the regional scale, I actually don't care about depositional site. So when I do prospectivity analysis at a Kratten scale, I don't factor in depositional mechanism because it, it doesn't actually matter. Right? So you look at the Yilgarn block in West Australia, which I showed you before. You name a rock type in the, in the Yilgarn block, I can name you a deposit over a million ounces. Any rock type. It, it, it tells you that it actually doesn't care. There are rocks that, at the end of the day, are more favorable in some areas than others. But that's often very just provincial scale. And it won't carry over to the next Archean greenstone belt that you go into. Right? It's about how you get the metals there, how you get the the mass transfer through the lithosphere into a small volume of rock. OK, so back to the circles I talked to you about. The, 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 min the, the critical elements of the mineral system, you need a fertile area. And I'll talk about these in, in, in just briefly. Favorable whole lithosphere architecture, these transient geodynamic triggers when, when the system is self-organized. 
and you need to preserve the primary depositional zone, which is generally the upper 10 kilometers of the, uh, of the crust for most systems. So let's have a look at architecture. So the premise here is, is that architecture is acting as a multi-scale fluid delivery system. So what we want to know is what aspects of architecture allow that focusing of the mass and energy from a source region in through a small volume of, of rock where it'll find a way to deposit. This is looking at the Yogarn Kraton again, but, but a very different way of mapping it. This is, uh, an, on your left, is, a, is an, uh, a neodymium isotopic map of the late granite bloom that stitches together the, the Kraton. The way to read the map is that the cooler colors are granites that melted old crust. The cooler, the older. On the right, uh, where, where you, sorry, the uh, hot colors are uh, granites that have melted younger crust, just a few tens of millions of years older than the granites themselves. And the thing to, to draw your attention to is the gradient that's marked there by the black arrows. That is interpreted as being a paleocratin margin at about 2.7 billion years ago. And all of the tier one nickel deposits lie along it. And when that gets inverted around 60 million years later, it's where all the tier one gold deposits are. Uh, th there's also, uh, by using, combining uh, uranium lead and zircon with lutetium hafnium, you can actually do time slices of this. And uh, one of our students has done that in the Yogarn province here. These nickel deposits in the Forestania belt here are uh, older. They're, that's the, the, the map on the left is 2.7 billion years. This is a time slice at 2.9 billion years when those nickel deposits formed, again, with the Kamadiites clustering around the, the Kraton margin. So what we're using now is the isotopes as paleogeophysics in that sense. Because if you look at the, we can do geophysical surveys across this Kraton. The issue is, is that the geophysics give us what it looks like now. By combining that with the isotopes, we can actually see what that looks like then, because we want to know the architecture at the time of mineralization. Just to look at multi-scale aspects of the, of, of the architecture, I like to use the example of Antonina. Most of you are familiar with this deposit in, in, uh, in Peru. So Antamina, in the top diagrams, are shown schematically at the deposit scale. And the, if the deposit, the intrus intrusion that, the, that this uh, polymetallic scarn is related to, has come up the junction of a thrust fault, which is at the top right hand of the block, uh, the ridge top thrust, and a transfer fault that goes down the valley that partitions a different deformational response that can be mapped on either side of that, more extension or less extension, more compression, less compression on the side. It's very cryptic. It's only really marked by jointing, and in this particular case, by the intrusion. When I step out of scale, so if I go to the, to the bottom left corner, I actually struggle to go on the ground and find that fault that controls Antonia, that transfer fault. In fact, the only way you can map it is by the fact that the, that the, the, the faults and the folds warp around it, or that you have maybe more faults or more folds on one side and less on the other side. I st so it's very cryptic. I step out again a scale, and the work done by, by uh, David Love showed quite nicely that these east-northeast uh, trending features actually control the stratigraphy. Right? So here you have Antamina. It's formed at about 9 million years. It uses an architecture that was set up at 42 million years in the Incaean orogeny during the uh, thrusting, using a, a, an, which uses an architecture that was set up 150 million years ago or so, when these things were deposited in a back arc off, the, uh, off of uh, South America, the west coast of South America. And then when we do work in the Pataz region, up a little bit to the northeast, we can see that these east-northeast features are still there, and they're at least 300 million years old. 
So these fundamental flaws in the lithosphere, they're deeply rooted in the, in the, in the lithosphere, and they get reactivated time and time again through, uh, through time. And so we call these things, for want of a better term, vertically accretive structures. They're structures that are fundamental in the basement. They're long-lived. They're often very, very old. Really hard to see. And What's that? Really hard to see. Yeah. yeah. And, they, and they, they try to propagate up through ro any rock that is deposited or abducted on top of it. The key message is that they can re be a re like an antimena, they can just be cryptic jointing at surface, but they overlie something fundamental at depth. So at the, at the, at the depth of exposure that we as explorers are interested in, because we either want to be on or above the deposit, right? they may not be the obvious structures. Right? And that's a really important message for exploration. So just some, some uh, uh, features of these. They're strike extensive, they're depth extensive, often in through, into the, or through the lithospheric mantle. And when we image them in, in, in uh, geophysics, such like, as M, like MT or gravity or with the isotopes, we generally find that they're pretty steep features. They commonly juxtapose very different basement, dema basement domains based on, on magma chemistry or, uh, or the isotopes within that multiply reactivated with a very long history and often a very weird strike to displacement ratio. They can go for you know, hundreds of kilometers and then when you go look at them, they've only got less than 100 meters displacement. That just doesn't match. Right? So that's a key sign. And you've got, I've got an example in there also of uh, the mother load. Great example, you've got uh, 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 Paleozoic crust to the east, Phanerozoic lithosphere to the west. When you look at the mother load faults themselves and you go up and map them, they're not really big displacement, but they go for a long, long way. Right? And that's an example of an anastomosing brittle fault system sitting above what's actually fundamentally a big, deep rooted uh, lithospheric flaw. So now into transient geodynamics. And this is one of the key things that really has come about, I, I think, in the last especially 10 years, but you could know, stretch it back, uh, um, back into even the mid-90s, that we really started to realize this. Uh, the more we can actually date deposits, the more we realize they form in brief moments in time, and, and generally within the resolution of, our, of, of error of the geochronological techniques. Right? So we used to start talking about mineral systems, like when, when I was working in gold deposits during my, uh, my PhD, we talked about, uh, about mineral deposits forming in you know, a few million years. And then we started to be able to date some of these systems and realize, oh, it's actually more like a million years. And then we started to look at them again and said, well, actually, it's probably more like a few hundred thousand years. And now, the work done by uh, uh, people like uh, Ken Hickey and Dick Tosdell in the Carlin trend, you know, you're looking at you know, maybe 100 million ounces of gold coming in in somewhere, maybe as, le as little as 20,000 years. Right? Things like chonoliths forming within maybe a year you know, that, that hosts some nickel sulfide deposits. So these are the types of, uh, uh, of time frames we're looking at. Very, very fast. So a lot of metal being deposited in a very, very short time frame. So something's unusual about these moments in time because these origins last a lot longer than that. A few orders of magnitude sometimes order longer than the mineral system itself, than the uh, high quality ore itself. So what is it that's unique about these things? Okay. So you've got, this schematically shows on the left, you've got a source, you've got the fluid going, going through to the sink, you're getting alteration, you're getting metal anomalism, you may even get some instances of, 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 uh, of, of mineralization, but you're not forming high quality ore. Then a moment, a moment happens in the history of that, the system self-orders and you get high quality ore formation for a very, very brief moment of time. And then you destroy those conditions and you go back to the broad metal anomalism. Now the issue is, if we're hunting these broad halos because they're easier to find, they're easier to map and find, so that's what we'll chase, right? We can spend a lot of money on them and, and, and that money be wasted if that particular area 
never underwent the high quality ore forming criteria. And if these things are, are look very different than those, right, we may not be chasing the right thing. So how do we understand high quality ore formation is very important. So transient geodynamic events. I've given you a couple more examples in the notes, but here's a, here's a good one from uh, uh, Southeast Australia. So you've got um, Acadia North Park, Park, so you've got uh, 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 porphyry copper gold systems here. You go into the uh, Western Lachlan and you've got traditional orogenic gold, vein, laminated vein hosted gold deposits. Two very different mineral deposit styles. An economic geologist traditionally wouldn't put them in the same bin. Same geodynamic trigger, all forming at 440 million years, which just so happens to be the same as the gold in, in, in the stands, the major gold event in the stands. The one in your notes shows you, uh, it doesn't quite show, Cripple Creek, Bingham Canyon, Carlin, three very different mineral systems, you know, alkaline epithermal, porphyry copper, uh, and whatever Carlin is, that whatever you want to make it, right? And uh, very different expressions of, of, of mineralization, same geodynamic trigger. Also happens to correlate with the, uh, the post-collisional porphyries in, in southwest China. Also correlates with the opening of the Drake Passage between South America and Antarctica. Now these things are often global in nature and, and usually represent periods of major plate reorganization as, as one of these triggers, and we'll get to that in a second. So if, empirically, we recognize three scenarios over right here. Incipient extension, transient compression, and switches in far field stresses as, as three generic situations where you get potentially high quality ore formation, these transient geodynamic events. So what's common during these events? First of all, you've stopped creating active permeability in the crust. So you're at a situation where you're not creating a lot of fractures that the fluids can go and, and just be diffusely put through the crust in, right? So what happens? Uh, or, or you clamp the permeability if you're under transient compression. So, so what happens is that the, the, the system is still putting in the energy. You still have the melting, you still have magmas, you still have dewatering of the crust or fluids or wherever you want that fluid reservoir to be coming from. You're still putting that energy in but you're not letting it get to the surface. You're not letting it go through to its sink. So you build these extreme fluid pressure and energy gradients, and the system self-orders, and when it goes bang, it goes bang and it forms high quality ore, right? usually in these exit conduits. And as long as I keep the conditions in place, I'm in the ore forming window. As soon as I go into the next BMS environment, re classic, uh, re regime, very classic. No, no more, no more high quality ore. Right? So there's a whole bunch of systems we can talk about like that. Um, this is an example of the here, uh, very large epithermal uh, uh, gold deposit and Solwara, a very gold rich BMS deposit. Again, two separate bins, actually the same geodynamic trigger, incipient extension. Right? So incipient extension, you're forming the high um, uh, high fluid pressure and energy gradients, you get the high quality ore. As soon as you have the back arc rifting established, no more high quality ore formation. Right? The only, it's only at the time of the, of the rifting, of the incipient rifting. The transient uh, uh, anomalous compression, a uh, good example, this was stuff put together by Rosenbaum et al. in, uh, in 2005, looking at the Nazca Ridge sweeping a, a, through South America. What happens is as that ridge sweeps through, above it, right, you're, cho you're almost choking the subduction zone. So the thing is under anomalous compression. You've clamped the vertical permeability. So what happens? Volcanism shuts off. And ore formation happens. As soon as the ridge moves, the volcanism starts again, and the ore stops. So a good example of, of anomalous transient compression, clamping that vertical, vertical permeability. You build the extreme gradients again, and you get the high quality ore. As soon as you stop that situation, no more high quality ore. And uh, it's interesting that uh, if you look at the, at the, at the um, 
uh, Andes, the, the three major events that have been uh, identified for, for the biggest, highest quality uh, ore uh, have been uh, mapped down now to happening within a million years or less, right? the, the, these, uh, uh, these events, within, a, a, within a, an orogeny that's been 100 million years as an as a, as a, as a, um, anomalously compressional overall margin. And uh, those three periods are mapped to periods of anomalous compression. Stress switches. A good example here is the is the Juno Gold Belt, right? The whole thing going for 100 million years or more. You've got orthogonal uh, subduction. All of a sudden, it goes oblique, right? At that moment, at 55 million years, high quality ore formation, and you get the gold deposits. As soon as you move into the next, you once you've moved fully into that uh, into that transtensional regime, you still have deformation. You still have metamorphism, you still have crustal dewatering, you still have magmatism in places, right? But no more high quality ore, only at that moment, right? When you go through a stress switch in the crust, you're switching sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. When that happens, there must be a period where sigma one is approximately sigma two, right? Or sigma three, and maybe all three being So your differential stress comes down so you just have a sphere, right? When that happens, the rock doesn't know what to do. It's not being told what to do, right? So you, you actually stop a lot of active permeability creation, and, but you build up the fluid pressure gradient, and now the fluid drives it, bang, right? So 55 million years, what else happens at that time? Diamonds in the slave, right? So these, these big plate motion switches, and I already told you about the 38 million year event globally, 110 million years, mother load on one side of the Pacific, North China, Krat and Gold on the other side. What's happening then? The emergence of the Antong Java Plateau in the middle of the South Pacific. Right? Plate reorganization, the whole thing goes, okay, hang on a second. You, know, you form some self-organization in the high quality ore, and as soon as you go into the next regime, no. uh, sediment hosted lead zinc, right? Classically, they're at the transition from, from drift of a passive, mar passive margin to rift. And at that moment, you get the, you get the uh, lead zinc formation, and after that, you, there were stops. So fertility. Now what is fertility? It's a, it's a geological region or time period that's systematically better endowed than, than other otherwise equivalent areas. And you can talk about secular earth evolution, like with chromatiates. You know, we see more chromatiates in the Archean, and then you know, they become very, very rare into the, into the Proterozoic and Phanerozoic. Um, lithosphere of fertility, so you can have a, bo a body of rock that's just preferentially enriched in the metal right, as, a, as a fertility. You could also have a time period like you don't look for unconformity uranium before the global oxidation event because you couldn't take U4 uh, plus and make it U6 plus to move around. Right. Um, geodynamic context, for example, magmatic uh, uh, co uh, uh, copper, porphyry copper. And in many cases, paleo latitude, certainly in lead zinc, uh, and, and uh, now more work coming out that it's probably in uranium, and we think it's in, in iron systems, the upgrade of BIF systems as well, to high grade iron ore. So you have to have those basinal brines, you have to be in the evaporite belts, the brine factories of the, of the earth. This is just an example from, from Monsky et al. 2012 about how small volume melts um, during flat subduction can stall and enrich the mantle of lithosphere. That can happen millions of years, hundreds of millions of years before the actual event that then transfers that gold into the upper crust. So how does that impact our targeting? We actually can't say anymore that this arc is favorable, right? Because there could be a, a portion of the arc that's quite favorable, has a lot of big deposits, a portion of the arc that isn't favorable, right, because it has nothing, and part that's just mo moderately endowed. Right? And that's what's shown in the top diagram. Now, put it under cover, like in the bottom, right? and I could be in a barren bit of a belt, but if I have something out for, some, something that can tell me that I actually had a strongly endowed segment, right, 
then that, that becomes a, 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 an area that I want to select. And these are often um, bounded along an arc by these high, high angle, um, deep, vertically accretive structures we talked about, like an antimina. So just to put it together, um, the uh, Andean margin, uh, it's been, since the uh, Cretaceous, uh, what happens, the mid-ocean ridge uh, opens, moves a lot faster, pushes South America hard to the west, and so you make this an anomalously compressional margin along its entire length. If you actually map subduction zone dip around the world, South America is very weird because it has a high proportion of subduction, less than 20 degrees, and you don't see that anywhere else, right? It is, the, it is an anomalously compressional margin. The, the slab can't sink fast enough before South America is coming over it. That, that's what's happening. Right? Yet, that alone isn't enough to make the ore. Right? You need that transient compression that clamps that vertical permeability, gets the high quality ore formation, and in fact, even a third order of, of threshold barrier could be the physical threshold barrier you get under the carapace of previously crystallized crystallized phases of the intrusion might even act as another nested scale. So when you apply a mineral systems approach, the key thing is, um, is, is having your decisions match to the scale of the relevant mineral system process. Right? Now when I, I, I do this type of exercise a lot, I did it a lot when I was 10 years in SRK and, I, and, I, and at CET, I mean we're the Center for Exploration Targeting, right? I do this a lot with, with people. And every time you come to a problem, it's about scale, right? People are confusing scales. And I already talked about the fact that we all often wait in our, in our targeting, the site of deposition uh, gets a heavy weighting and the processes that are, that are important at the site of deposition. And if I'm targeting at this, at, 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 you know, at that scale, that's fa that's fantastic. When we go out of scale, though, that becomes less relevant. Yet we still weight it really heavily, and it's because that's where we're comfortable. That's where we can see things, touch things. We've got more data. We we understand the processes a bit better, even though they're com albeit that they're complex. Right? So, and it also it tends to bias. <coughs> us to data rich areas at the expense of data poor areas and of course when we're going undercover we're trying to target data poor areas and we don't want to underweight them just because they have no data right it's like um, people saying well to, 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 to target into a mineral system first go to a place where you got signs of mineralization okay then you know uh, then then you sort of vector it's like okay time out right that's like it reminds me of a comedy routine Steve Martin had in the 1970s he said how to be a millionaire and not pay taxes, right? First, get a million dollars, right? And that's what, that's tends how we act as, a, as, a, as an industry, this is that we're, we're following that sign of mineralization that we empirically pick up, right? And we've got to be able now to get better at predicting where it might be where there is as yet no sign, right? And again, this, this scale issue. So just closing out here, at the biggest scale, the broad regional scale, what you're wanting to do is collect evidence of the mineral system, that, there, that, that a mineral system was, was permissive here that could have formed high quality ore. Fertility, whole lithosphere architecture, transient geodynamic trigger that you think might be there. Right? Whatever you can get by mapping by proxies, you need, you need to develop proxies at that scale with data sets you can get at that scale for those things. When you then said, okay, this is the place I want to be in, now I'm worried about where is the camp. I want to now detect evidence that the mineral system actually operated. I want to start to see evidence of the zones of mass energy of flux. So again, now I'm architecture, local geodynamics. I'm also now worried about have I preserved the, 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 the depositional zone. And then, when I get down to the deposit, you know, the prospect scale or delineating ore shoots within a deposit, now I'm largely depending on systematic detection, although there's still a lot of brain power that has to go into integrating these data sets and getting the most out of them to understand that quickly and on as sparse as possible data. 
So that shows, as just an example that was put together for gold, I won't go through it in detail, but basically it's showing that at the, if you're worried at the continental province scale to narrow your search down, you're not even worried about things like depositional processes. Right? By the time you get down to the ore chute, you're worried about specific processes of deposition and local architecture, you're not worried about the fertility thing anymore because that's operating at a fewer, it's a magnitude more higher scale. Right? So that's my takeaway slide. And uh, that's the one I gave you at the beginning, as promised. <laughs> so the fact that these are dyna uh, dynamic, uh, uh, systems, complex systems, and they exhibit this self-organized critical behavior. Because they're self-organized uh, uh, critical systems, they're also inherently, they have to be predictable. They're not the random alignment of events, otherwise we have a Gaussian distribution of deposit sizes. Right? So they are predictable, and Good point. So, so now we have to, uh, through this framework, it's about developing the, the, the proxies to map these at various scales and understand those processes uh, uh, better find out where the high value information gaps are. That's it. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. I believe. Oh, yes. <laughs> wait, <laughs> wait, wait. Questions, questions, questions? Questions? Questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah this uh, 2014 <laughs> reference that's on so many of the slides, where is that? That's uh, the, the SEG in. Uh, in um, Keystone. Uh, Keystone. That's the one that I was supposed to go to, and for various reasons couldn't. That was uh, that was a, a special. That's in that volume. It's a special paper. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. That's great. There's a lot of good stuff in that volume. What, and wasn't some of that summarized in a SEG newsletter article? Uh, yes. Uh, John Ronsky put out something on the self-organizing critical systems around 2011. Yes. But this is from the uh, proceedings volume of the Keystone. Yeah, that's right. Special paper 18, SEG special paper 18. If the SEG booth was still open, I'd send you there. But I think they probably have a digital. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, probably. They probably have a digital. You can download it. They, you, they make a digital one, but you can't cut the digital copy open. So you have to keep it as a book. Yes, that's but right. you can print it though. Yeah. No, it's it's no permissions. Oh yeah. It's a monolithic PDF of the whole volume. Yeah, it's huge. It's, it's huge. Give me a few hours. It's like they did with the hundred. <laughs> it's, like, yeah, it's like they did with the hundred hours. <laughs> Give me a few hours. At DMAC, we're versatile. Yes. <laughs> one one of the things, Cam, and you you touched on the Carlin and uh, and Bingham, and I had a chance to look at some aspects of both of those in the last year and a half. But if you link them in time, and I still think of, well, one's in eastern Nevada and one's, one's in Salt Lake, that distance probably existed then. But if you're, you're, you're narrowing things down and you say, well, all of these things sort of happen in a very, very limited space of time, something really strange was happening to the earth over a broad area. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the point. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's sort of like you're stepping yep. back, and I've, yep. I've heard about super plumes, but I'm thinking, were there, were there 20 super plumes all happening at the same time? It's just yeah. sort of like, yeah. whoa. Yeah, exactly. And now the thing is, is that, that it's hard to map that spatially and have it make relevance for, for, for yeah. exploration, right? So, but let's consider this. With, with porphyry copper systems, and this is based on the really good work of, of Bob Lowe's, who has got fantastic data set together, and he's shown that what happens in copper magmas right, is that you go through a, a, a period where you go under anomalous compression. And what that does is it causes the magma to pond at depth instead of lower in the crust. When you do that, you suppress plagioclase crystallization. And because of that, the magma becomes immortal. Right? As long as it stays there, it will not freeze very easily. So it builds up very high volatile contents and high metal contents. And it self-organizes to form ore. As soon as you let that go, the ore stops, right? Because now the magma isn't ponding and building up, you've drained the reservoir, right? So what if we could go to a terrain and, and, and map that moment of, of, of uh, if a magma has gone through that moment, or the products of that magma has gone through that moment, that should be visible in detrital minerals. Right? 
that's, that's, so, that's what we're, we're, that's what I tried to do with I yeah, go I, to yeah. exactly what we tried to do. So, so, so now you've got a concept. That's exactly what we're trying. Now you've got a concept yeah. that you can then go map, right? And now you've got the exactly G10 what, equivalent. But they didn't do it for porphyry copper, right? What about nickel sulfides, right? Nickel sulfides. You've got, you know, we talk about charnels to igneous petrologists, right? And a lot of people go, well, I don't see them as important because there's not a lot on them in the literature, or they did that 10 years ago. And they're important because only almost every nickel sulfide deposits in one, right? They're tubes, they're magma tubes, right? So the question then becomes, what stops a mafic magma from being in place as a sheet or a dike and causes it to be a tube, right? What's the dynamic environment that causes that? And that's your moment of ore formation. And the more we look at these things, the more we'll find there are actually some volatiles in them. There's like, you know, that they're... they're so there's... Well, it makes you question... We, we, we have we an equivalent situation in VMS environments. Oh, okay. uh, because uh, we, know, we know from, uh, from, from, from all the studies that Really, when you have VMS environment, especially in the bimodal terrain, I mean, there are other systems, but in bimodal, you have two liquids, right? You have a mafic liquid that's caused by melting of the mantle, and you have another liquid, which is a felsic liquid. Both of them can evolve somewhat, but, but they're, really, they're really separate, and they don't, they, don't, they don't really mix. But lo and behold, when you, when you get your VMS horizon or your fertile horizon, lo and behold, you have these really weird results that appear those uh, Icelandites, whatever. They're very strange, uh, but they, they, they're, they're there. They're very, uh, they're very easy to recognize. And there's probably something happening in the magma chambers that's causing uh, the, your, your mafic magma to all of a sudden be, be critically contaminated by something. So, and and there, this has a response both in terms of heat and also in terms of the, the liquids that are that are evolving very quickly. Well, a really good way to charge a, a felsic magma with, with the volatiles is to bring melt into it. Yeah, that's right. So it might be that they're that's coming right. into the chamber. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, that's a, this self-organized critical system makes you, there's a whole other talk. I gave a course yep. two, two years ago on ore shoots. And, and the self-organized critical system and what it meant for mapping ore shoots, right? So very specific. So that has a whole range of implications in there as well. Okay, okay.